Wow. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone is doing okay. My name is Bobby Haber. I'm here with my partner, Joanne Abbott Green, here in New York City. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our Mondo Conversation series. We thank you for sharing part of your day with us and look forward to seeing you in the coming weeks. And of course, at Mondo NYC, October the 13th through the 16th. Today, we're proud to present Building Virtual Music Communities and Engaging Platforms as we explore the role artists, community managers, music fans, and curators play in creating successful digital communities. Our moderator is John Vlauten, CEO of SpinLab Communications, a boutique corporate communication agency, communications agency, excuse me, serving the music and media industries. John is based in LA. Previously, John was Senior Vice President of Corporate Communications at Live Nation Entertainment and an artist publicist working closely with such artists as the Dave Matthews Band, Maroon 5, Ray LaMontagne, Snoop Dogg, U2, Melissa Etheridge, Damian Marley, and many, many others, and a good friend and colleague for many, many years. John, it's all yours. Take it away. Wow. <clears throat> thanks, Bobby. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. I see some familiar faces that are uh, out there. Uh, Jerry Lemba, Mark Cates, uh, Imogen, um, it's making me nervous, um, but um, I want to welcome everybody to building virtual music communities and engaging platforms. Um, now more than ever, building communities online that promote discovery and music exploration is key to artist development and to the growth of our industry. Our panelists today have been founding, creating, nurturing, and managing these platforms for many years. From EDM.com's Rapid Rise to So Far Sound's Intimate Global Live Experience Network, to Flight House's highly engaged TikTok community, to Interscope's expertise on artist brand building on multiple digital platforms, we know one thing for sure artists and their fans need online communities now more than ever, especially now when we can't all get together. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce each of our panelists. Um, uh, we have Ethan Baer, who's head of electronic at Create Music Group. Um, he's also a founder of EDM.com. We have Kristen Taylor, who's city director of Baltimore for So Far Sounds, uh, which operate, operates uh, private shows in, in unique venues in 400 cities around the country. She's also an amazing artist in her own right. Um, Ramon Alvarez Michael, who's senior director of digital content and digital and content marketing Interscope, um, and Ash Stahl, who's the managing director of Flight House, which is a TikTok channel with more than 26 million followers. And she's also uh, has a side gig as manager for Said the Sky um, International DJ. So um, let's get started. Um, you know, share, why don't you share? Um, you know, what you, um, you know, where you work, what, what you do specifically, and talk a little bit about your, um, you know, what a virtual music community means to you. Um, Ash, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, um, so just a little bit of background on Flight House. So we've been around on Flight House and we're on TikTok since the Musical.ly days. So we started out about four years ago, I think, and we started as a sound page. So we were uploading like sped up versions of songs that influencers and just users of the platform would come to to use in their like lip syncing videos. And so we've had to really evolve with the platform and we've kind of grown it into what it is today, which forward facing, we have 26 million followers. We were the first uh, premium TikTok first uh, like company to make media like this. And we still keep you know, music, it has been and always will be in our DNA. So most of our content still is, is very heavily driven by music. And then on the, on the back end of what we do is we work with every major label as well as like large brands at this point to help them with like white label marketing services. So we've been a part of 
the Arizona Zervis Roxanne campaign, Doja Cat Say So, lots of other Doja Cat songs, Surfaces. Um, so a lot of big, you know, TikTok moments that we've kind of helped to create, like tap into the community on the platform for. And then outside of Flight House, my management client said the sky, um, you know, recently, especially with, you know, the, the scenario and just COVID and, hey, we can't play shows or and our album plan is kind of out the window for now. Let's make TikTok content. So he, we were able to like grow his account to, I think, 130,000 followers on TikTok within that first month of quarantine, just by really kind of figuring out ways that we can take what he likes, which is music and make that something that TikTok likes as well. Um, but yeah, I think I've always been, I actually start, Ethan hired me as my first ever job working in music at edm.com. So I've always been involved with the uh, like music industry and like music community side of things. So it's definitely super valuable. And I love that I get to be a part of that every day and continuing to like grow those communities. <clears throat> I had no idea there was that connection. Um, yes. Ethan, edm.com grew from, you know, you basically started it to really a you know a, a central kind of hub for that music community do you want to talk uh, briefly about you know how you built that and what that meant sure absolutely yeah so i started it really in college as a way for me to share with my friends the music that i was playing in my dj sets so it really just started as like me uploading the music that i was playing and kind of doing little write-ups of the music and eventually it turned into launching a website called dubstep.net, uh, another one called house.net, one called trapmusic.net. Eventually we had about 14 different websites and the goal of each of them was to really cultivate a community around a specific type of music. And our initial strategy was like get exact match domains in each space so that we, we really were at least from public perception, like the central hub for all things that genre. And that strategy was really good in kind of, I, I see really like two steps in kind of this virtual audience development. And for me, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but for me, those two steps are really like taking what you have, whether you're an artist or a label or an influencer or a creator of some kind and utilizing different platforms, whether that be press or streaming platforms or video, YouTube, whatever, but taking what you already have and trying to reach as many people as possible, right? For stage one, maximize your total reach. Stage two is of all those people that you reach, you have to identify which one of those or which of those people actually care and are relevant to what you're doing and then draw those people in and start fostering the community. So maximize reach first, identify real potential fans and then find a way to create content that engages those fans. So edm.com ultimately became a place that a lot of different people in the industry, whether it's promoters and their events or managers and their artists or labels and their various clients would come to us primarily for that first stage, right? So we have this content, we have this mu music, we have this new artist, and we are going into the phase where we need to reach as many people as possible so we can start identifying who is going to care about this project. And then, you know, the other kind of part that comes out of maximizing reach is ultimately you're never going to really understand what demographics care about you, what type of fans care about you. You're not going to have the data to understand who your audience is until you get kind of that critical mass. And I always saw our role as press as helping people achieve that critical mass and helping instill in the audience of these people, whether it's it's the greater edm.com audience or the already existing fans of these artists or whatever, trying to get them to really understand what the bigger story is, right? So anyone can find music, anyone can be an artist, anyone can be a label, but what is the story that makes people care? So if you're able to reach that critical mass and actually paint a story that gets people excited or makes them feel like they're missing out on something or connects with them on some sort of emotional level, that's that's really where that comes in and that was that was i would say our role at edm.com was helping people reach that critical mass while also telling a story that will identify from that wider audience who are actually going to be the real fans and the real community around whoever this is that we're shining the spotlight on that's awesome all right cool ramon uh at interscope you you're a lot of a lot of times the first artists uh 
you know, you, you guide artists through the process of building their social media platforms and you, you really operate on just a whole wide swath of different levels. You want to talk a little bit about what you do over there? Yeah, so over at Interscope, I do digital and content marketing. Um, the first piece of it is kind of overseeing the digital strategy for roughly like 35 artists day to day on the Interscope roster, um, you know, determining along with the artists how to really, um, you know, help them execute their vision online. Um, the second piece of it um, on the content side is really trying to figure out ways to find different content creators, high level people um, on the internet to help expand the artist's vision, but also kind of keep it aligned with um, what it is they're trying to communicate through the music and the product that they obviously um, hold so near and dear to them. So, um, you know, a lot of what I'm doing, you know, as it relates to communities is, is trying to figure out how um, best and most organically to, um, you know, expand an artist's community, expand an artist's platform, um, while not making it feel like, um, you know, the artist is necessarily trying to do that. I'm just trying to provide as much content um, and organic um, touch points as I can for a fan base to kind of help continue it to grow um, while the artist continues to do what they do um, best, which is obviously put out, record, and make music. And, you know, videos and all that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, I guess, pieces that go into it, but that's kind of like the broad strokes of um, and, and the overview. Awesome. Um, Kristen, so you, in addition to, to running so far as Baltimore operation, um, and I assume that that includes uh, finding great artists to play your shows, you're an artist yourself. Um, you want to talk a little bit about um, what that's like to wear those two hats? Yeah, so uh, we're having some problems hearing you, I think. Taking the brunt of the still not being heard. Uh, maybe if you, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, All right. Oh, uh, that's much be better. better. I mean, we're, we're going to miss <laughs> seeing the outside, but I, I think we'd rather hear you. Definitely. And I'm going to miss that breeze, but I'd love to talk with you guys. So again, hi, um, everybody. I am, um, as you said, also an artist on top of um, being a part of So Far Sounds as the city, um, city director for So Far Baltimore, as well as on the artist um, community management team. Um, as an artist, it's amazing, honestly, to wear those two hats. Um, before I actually um, got the job at So Far, I was a So Far artist, and I kept putting out into the universe that I just wanted to be able to give back to other artists and to be for other artists what I, you know, wanted um, coming up. So. So far was the perfect opportunity to seek out other artists, like give credit where credit is due, support other artists, help them to connect with other cities and perform all over the world. So it's been amazing. Um, so far has been around for over a decade, connecting like independent artists with new audiences, allowing people to explore their city, support their local um, musical community as well as their local businesses. Um, and now with COVID happening, <laughs> our shows of course are at a halt. So on the local level, you know, like we have in session, continuing to connect our artist community with us during this time where they can't play shows or where everything is virtual. So it's definitely um, an amazing balance that you were almost forced into, everybody was forced into um, figuring out how to continue using these, um, these online communities to to make the best of um, continuing these connections and um, maximizing on your network and connecting with other people and still remaining creative through this whole process. So it's definitely been a great balance. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks, everybody. And I want to encourage, we'll have a chance towards the end of the session to answer your questions. So I, you know, Ben, I see your question. It's a good one. We'll get to it. If you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, you know, before we end. Um, can we just briefly discuss, um, you know, there's different kinds of virtual communities and you guys are good examples of, of, of all of them. 
Um, but what's the difference between a virtual community built on a social platform, let's say Instagram, you know, an artist page on Instagram versus a more insular program uh, platform like say, so far in session or so far as listening room or edm.com is there you know it do you guys have a feeling whether um you know which are more important for artists or is it all important do you have any thoughts on that um ash i mean i think from from my side like looking at tiktok and on the artist side in particular i think out of all the social platforms that said the sky is on um, most of the others are real like diehard fans. Obviously, we have his like fan group page, which has like 5,000 of his really true diehard fans. And we have his Twitter, which is like a larger group of less diehard, his Instagram even less so. And then TikTok, just the nature of the platform is that you're not getting shown content of people that you follow. So the whole game on TikTok is that you need to hit in the algorithm and make people want to see you. So like even on Flight House, some of our most popular videos that have 20, 30, 40 million views, if you look at the analytics, 95% of those viewers are coming from the For You page. So they're coming from, they're not following you. They don't know you. They were just served this video in their feed, which is fine. But I think when looking at TikTok for an art, like as an artist, you're going to be like the, the most disconnected from your actual fan base as possible. So like to Ethan's example of you hit the whole kind of the largest audience possible and then you're gonna dial that in to who are the actual valuable like fans, TikTok's gonna be the most broad and just the most like generic. And I think, so for us on TikTok and looking at artists there, you know, our strategy on TikTok has been hey, let's take really popular TikTok songs and make remixes of them like so that people can see the process and they can see that he's a musician and they, but it, they also can tie it into what TikTok is. Um, but I think, sure, the goal there is for us to be able to make more real like diehard fans, but we're also having to acknowledge that it's that's not what the platform is. So I think, you know, that's going to be super different than from an Instagram or a fan page to an edm.com to a so far sounds. Right. I mean, Ramon, you must see that. You must grapple with that every, every day, right? Um, you know, serving an artist fan base and, and then, you know, trying to expand it at the same time. How do you look at that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, in a lot of cases, especially on, you know, the major label level, artists will come in with platforms that they're traditionally stronger on. So, you know, whether it's Twitter, um, Instagram or even TikTok nowadays, um, it's really trying to figure out how to, I guess, you know, come in and give guidance maybe on the platforms that their strengths are in to, to help expand that audience. I mean, I think TikTok, that point is exactly right. Um, it's so algorithmic based that, you know, a lot of it is just around, you know, frequency, I think, and making, making content that's kind of true to the artist and, and, you know, helping it to kind of connect. But I think on, on, on the Instagram side and the Twitter side, um, it is interesting because I think there's different kind of verticals within each of those. There's obviously the core fan base of, of an artist and the super community that kind of forms around them. And then there's all these different kind of pages that um, kind of help support that ecosystem. And a lot of times the artists will come in and, and kind of be on the path to releasing new music um, and have a really strong core fan base, but not be really mentioned in those additional conversations and those other pillars that, you know, have fans that could quickly convert. You know, so I think a lot of it is figuring out um, which of those verticals the artists will be and their brand really and their content um, will overperform in um, and really trying to kind of guide them into um, and, and give them a real understanding of, you know, why the content that they make for the Internet on these specific platforms, um, you know, should be, you know, more frequent or more like this or more like that based on, you know, overperforming content pieces that we've seen. So. I think, you know, they all tie together. And I think to the initial question, it's like, you know, you can't really have one without the other and have a sustained kind of online presence. I think it's really important to at least have a profile and a presence on each of these kind of verticals because they all speak to um, kind of, you know, completely different groups of people. And, you know, there's places, you know, on Instagram and Twitter where TikTok people live, but obviously TikTok is such a, you know, 
uh, separate ecosystem from all of this, both in the upside um, and also in the traditional social conversation that I think it's kind of important to have presences on all those different places. Um, Ethan, I know like for, for what, you know, I know you do more than this at Create, but like Create is really known as, as you know, understanding how to maximize YouTube and sure. really make that platform work for artists. I mean, how do you see, and you know, it can be also a revenue driver for artists, which these other platforms aren't really. So, um, you know, how do you, how does that fit in? Like how important is it to build a community on YouTube for, for artists, you know, of any, any genre really? Sure. I mean, I would have had a different answer for you maybe a year ago before coming to create and having a full understanding of exactly what YouTube is capable of. But I would say having a, for an artist, having a strong presence on a video streaming platform is incredibly important. I think YouTube of all of the different video platforms right now, whether it's Twitch or Facebook Live or Instagram Live or whatever you're using, I think YouTube has the best like digital rights management ecosystem in place right now. So in terms of like being able to really effectively monetize all the content, it's probably the most solid right now. But that being said, I think a better question in terms of the community approach is really a focus on having video content. And I think that is one of the key values of TikTok where it brings you, it brings fans the ability to kind of directly connect with, the, with whoever the influencer is. However, like Ashley said, a lot of times it's brand new people that have no idea who you are, you too, which is great because you're, you're exposing brand new people to very personal content, right? So that's like that first phase that I was talking about before. And I think YouTube is kind of like oftentimes the next phase, but the cool thing about it is it's very strong at both. So, you know, there's the community page on YouTube now, which is kind of where the creator or artist or whatever directly engages with the people who already follow their channel. And it's pretty neglected. Not many people use the community section on their page, um, but it's incredibly powerful in terms of like getting engagement up on your page, maximizing performance from content that's about to come. So YouTube really has this ecosystem built for you to engage with your existing fans but it's also incredibly flexible in terms of reaching new audience, um, especially if you have a strong network partner. So one of the things that's really valuable about Create is we have a massive network of billions of monthly views already, right? And like all of the other social media platforms, running ads is basically a bid system. You know, you're on the back end, you decide the type of people you wanna reach, what type of content they're interested, and then you're bidding against everyone else who wants those same type of audience, right? The advantage to having a network partner like that, like us, is we can run your content specifically against other relevant content within our network without having to go through that bid system, which means that we're able to very, very kind of very hyper targeted reach exactly the type of people that we think that your content will most appeal to. So we can really hyper target that new audience but within the, within the scope of what people, like what type of people are gonna be interested, but we can also maximize reach on an international level as well. So YouTube and the other benefit of YouTube is it's also one of the most effective platforms for converting traffic off platform. Um, so from my perspective, YouTube is one of the most important platforms that an artist can build out. Uh, Kristen, so from, from a, you know, putting on your artist hat for a sec, which I know you probably never take off. Um, <laughs> you know, how, how, do you, how do you grapple with, with the enormity and the complexity of all these avenues? And like, how do you, like, how do you pick it? How do, where do you start? Like, how do you just conceptualize it as an artist? Yeah, it definitely is a lot. Like, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, but I think that the, the key for me and my artistry is figuring out what platforms allow me to be most aligned with my with my goals, most aligned with my true self, um, and most aligned with my art. So I feel like all of these is, is not necessarily having to pick and choose whether you are a part of it, but which one can you maximize the most? And knowing that you don't have the bandwidth to execute on every platform um, as well as you would hope. Um, so just choosing which ones are, are working for you in um, the stage you're in now or the project that you're working on now um, 
and also like understanding how each one works. So like so far is one of those platforms that you can tune into, you can check out shows, you can tune into the webinars if you need information around certain topics, um, but you're not tied to having to post content on it consistently, or you're not tied to having to have a particular genre of music to be relevant. It's one of those um, communities where you can tune in if you'd like, and then if you're having a bad day, you can disconnect and we'll still be here. Like you can check the video out, you know, the next day. Um, so as an artist, I think that autonomy um, for me is important because I'm not always on and like having to have this consistent post and this consistent brand image and all of that can be quite exhausting. Um, but having those platforms that, um, that you can tune into, like Ethan was saying around my particular genre, if I just wanna talk to people about you know, my genre and get some tips and tricks around what they're doing and what they're using, but having that autonomy to go elsewhere if I just wanna check out other things and get other ideas. I think as an artist, it's important to, create, to use your creative brain in the business side as well to like not pigeonhole yourself to a specific thing or to what other people think has been working and just like play around and like accumulate ideas and information from multiple sources and make it fit for what you're doing. Got it, yeah. That's great, thanks. Everybody, um, for those of you who are joining, you know, join late or just joining, I'm John Blotton, I run Spin Lab Communications, we're a PR firm. Um, we're, we have with us today, Ash Stahl, who's Managing Director of Flight House, and also uh, uh, manages the DJ Said the Sky. We have Ramon Alvarez Smyko, Senior Director of Digital, Con Digital and Content at Marketing at Interscope. We have Kristen Taylor, fabulous artist, and also the City Director of So Far Sounds Baltimore. And Ethan Baer, who's Head of Create at, uh, Head of um, Electronic Music at Create Music Group in Los Angeles. Um, so, um, Let's um, let's talk a minute about how how can new. You know, we've seen you know we've seen just within the you know this pandemic, right? So far, sounds launched um, an artist series called In Session. We've seen a ton of um, you know amazing live streams. You know, Instagram's Versus um, came on. Um, how how can artists and genres you know form? Um, be formed, how can, how can artists form online communities organically? And, you know, how can, you know, the industry kind of help to foster that? Um, Ethan, have you seen anything like that um, recently that you, um, you know, have kind of piqued your interest? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think there's a couple different ways. And I definitely want to echo what Ramon was saying earlier, where like, it's really, there's there's not really much point in saying which one of these platforms is best for making a community because that, that's like not really the point. The question is, is like which one of these platforms best resonate with a specific artist and with the fans that are going to be reached with that artist's content. And so for me, I've seen that take place in a couple different ways. Um, I've seen artists, for example, uh, Jana is a an electronic artist and then Boombox Cartel is another electronic artist and we've done stuff on Twitch with both of them. Um, Jana streams several hours every day, whether it's producing, um, you know, doing remixes, cooking, just talking to her fans and answering questions. Almost every day, she does a couple hours of streaming where she's directly connecting with her fans, talking to them, answering questions about their life and what they're struggling with. And it's very much like a personal, direct to consumer interaction, right? Uh, Boombox Cartel through a, this was like right at the beginning of the whole quarantine, the first round of quarantine, he threw an event called Cinco Mode, which was on Cinco de Mayo, and he brought a bunch of his favorite DJs, a lot of other Mexican-American and Mexican DJs, and they played this event, and they brought a lot of people from their communities in, and they were talking with them and kind of forging direct fan connections. Um, and then there's Tory Lanes, right? And he was doing his big Instagram live series, Quarantine Radio where he had guests from Drake, uh, Justin Bieber, random friends. And I think it was the most viewed Instagram live series ever where there were like 300 plus thousand people on every episode. So I don't think platform matters so much as finding a way 
to connect directly with your fans where it's not like they feel like, oh, this person is talking generally, but it also sort of feels like it could apply to me. I mean, like actually directly engaging with their your fans. And some for some people, they're able to do that with YouTube. For some people, it has to be Twitch where they're able to like actually talk to the people live. It really depends, but each artist has like a persona and a personality and a way that they like to conduct themselves and interact with their fans. And so the real objective, whether it's for their label marketer or their management or whatever, is figuring out where that artist is best going to connect with their fans and where their personality is going to shine through the most. Anybody else have a want to chime in on that? Ramon? Yeah. yeah, I think I think the quarantine radio thing is funny because while Tori was at Interscope, I, you know, oversaw his digital and, and really kind of tried to help make that moment as big as possible, kind of across platform. But like, I think to that point, like moments like that, which are completely out of left field, I think, you know, wasn't because someone at a label uh, told him to do it. It was because you have these artists who just kind of have these like creative sparks, right? I think another example that comes to mind for me from my roster is Machine Gun Kelly um, and his like quarantine covers, right? Like he's just been putting out content of, you know, punk, punk rock songs and pop rock songs that he's loved and even like a Love on the Brain cover, you know, where he got Marilyn Manson to be a part of it. Like there's all these different ways that, you know, um, you know, I think we're relying a lot on the creativity of artists because we're all kind of confined, confined in these spaces and they can't do the traditional things that they normally do. And, you know, I think the artists that are kind of increasing their audience during this time are the ones that are really able to kind of think outside of the box, able to really kind of execute on creative ideas, whether it's ideated by the team or themselves, and really just kind of be okay with just putting stuff out and seeing what happens. You know, I think a lot of the most viral content that we've seen, you know, even those two examples, you know, the, the, the D nice radio show where he had a million people, like, these are all just people just like with ideas and they're just like, okay, like I'm going to do this. And, you know, from what I've seen over the past, you know, few months now is that engagement is at a high point, attention spans are, you know, a lot lower, but if there's a really good idea, um, you're going to get a lot of people to share it and you're going to get a lot of people in and that word is going to travel exponentially faster than it would have even you know six months ago um so you know a lot of that stuff is 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 word of mouth based but it becomes actual cultural moments and you know we've seen people really be able to machine gun kelly i think is you know 1.5x his entire audience on social you know in the past like three months you know machine or tory lanes obviously he probably 6x his social in like you know a month and a half um so it's like people are coming out of this and people are, are you know, finding ways to really kind of use this moment of um, attentiveness, you know, to their advantage. Because, you know, artists are people who we look to, to, you know, guide us culturally and, you know, through times of, of challenge through their creativity and their music. And I think, you know, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, online is no exception to that. Right. Yeah. And just to, just to kind of echo what he was saying. I think a really important thing that you can kind of pull out of, of all of that is creating a, creating a community from scratch without any context is very difficult, right? But for example, the thing that we're talking about right now is quarantine, right? That's something that everyone can relate to on some level or another, right? And so what artists like Machine Gun T Kelly and Tory Lanez, what these guys are doing is they're identifying an existing community, right? That camaraderie that we all feel about being in this situation together. And they're tapping into that existing community in a way that feels organic. And they're taking that existing group of people that have already kind of clumped together for whatever reason. And they're casting that net over that already existing group and finding the people in there that can also relate to them and how they're experiencing that same greater movement. So these guys have identified a cultural moment or a viral moment, and they've tapped into it in a way that fits their brand. And so you can't force a community, but you can find things, you can find communities or opportunities or moments that already exist and kind of try and incorporate that or relate to that in a way that your fans or your consumers will understand and be able to connect with you on. And we're talking... We're talking a lot about, um, you know, artists building their fan bases and, and stuff. A, a lot of other stuff I've seen, you know, during, during uh, this time have been, you know, events like this um, or, or events or 
you know, different communities springing up where artists can help each other out and, and share information and share, you know, ideas about how they're getting through this challenging time. Kristen, like one thing that I thought has been really remarkable has been um, so far sounds launching in session, which is a artist focused webinar series, I guess you call it that, um, you know, where artists can, you know, get information, you have speakers. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you guys thought that was important um, to yeah, the so far community? Definitely. I think that, you know, during this time, it has been such a roller coaster for everyone, you know, financially, with their career, emotionally, everything. And we just wanted to, to kind of be that like anchor for our artist community. Um, in a way where they feel connected to their artistry, they're able to tap in and tune in if they want to hone their craft, if they want to um, gain more knowledge around specific subjects that they didn't have time to tap into while they were booking shows and while they were on the road. Um, so I think for us, it was, an, it was an important initiative that was kind of on our minds knowing that it was, it was necessary, but with COVID hitting, it, um, it made that, that initiative like push to the forefront um, in a way where our artist community and their teams are able to stay connected with one another uh, while also staying connected to the so far community and other artists within that community. Um, so I think that like, you know, there are certain topics that we may not have thought to tap into as artists or we had someone on our team that was handling that information. Um, so for in session, there are tons of different topics that are centered around artists specifically um, and information that they may be interested in or topics that they um, may benefit from. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, as an independent musician, sometimes you wear tons of hats and you don't always do all of them well or have all of the knowledge to do them well. So In Session is one of those um, initiatives that so far started to help our artists become more proficient in different areas of the music industry um, and stay connected. So we think it's like super important moving forward to continue that even once things are up and running in some form. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, I want to encourage if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, why don't we take a question now? Um, ben Forrester had a question um, that's very tactical. If a band um, already has a good organic grassroots fan base of around 1500 fans, what's the best way um, with little money, but, but a team of uh, an army of people wanting to work um, what do you guys advise is the best way and use time to to grow that fan base? Um, I know it might be kind of hard without knowing the genre or anything about the band, but just generally speaking, um, what do you guys think, Ash? I mean, I think like this goes for anyone and really the only thing that would ever stop it like is just that it's not very scalable. But at this size, I think something that helped set this guy its growth a lot is that we were engaging, we were every single person that left a comment on social media, like said this guy would respond to it or he would DM his fans. And that's something that anybody can do with no budget, just a matter of taking the time to do it. But making those like super early connections and ha feeling like they're really interacting with an artist is such a huge difference. And then they're gonna be more likely to go like tell other people about it. And I mean, that's not necessarily like, a marketing tactic just I think something that everyone should be doing that's going to really grow real fans that makes sense anybody else yeah I mean I I have one that's like pretty basic but one of the things that just from a pure marketing perspective that I've seen that's really effective when you have a very engaged but small fan base is things like pre-save campaigns where it's like you have a core base of fans who are incentivized to support you and you kind of got to tap into the whole like uh, the whole word of mouth viral share kind of idea, right? Where if you have a thousand people that support you and you can get each one of them to share it with one other person or with two people, you kind of have that kind of dissemination approach and good pre-save campaigns build followers on Spotify typically. And like one of the things that artists always look for on Spotify is like the vanity metric, right? Like monthly active users or total monthly listeners or whatever. But what I'm usually looking for and what I, you know, I'm sure Ramon and his team like are often looking for when they're working with their clients as well is like, 
how many followers does the actual does the person actually have? What's the ratio of their followers to their monthly listeners? Is it clearly driven by playlisting or they, do they actually have an engaged fan base? So anything that focuses not on vanity metrics, but focuses on actually building engagement is, is the number one thing you can focus on because you can throw a bunch of money at something and get big numbers, but big numbers don't mean anything if those people don't care about you. So having 1500 really engaged fans is an incredible start. That's a really, really strong place to start from. So if you, if you have that, I would feel really good about it and just figure out how you can use those people to help mobilize the next layer of connections. That's super, super important point about, um, you know, engagement and real fans and stuff. Um, I, okay. I have something to add. If yeah, you Kristen. I would also Thanks. encourage, like, I often encourage artists to collaborate, not just with other artists, because I feel like, you know, people do that quite often, like other musicians, but with other art forms and other um, arenas, like when people are invested in you or y'all, you work together on a particular project, that's more people bringing knowledge, bringing attention, you know, promoting this project, therefore promoting you. So utilizing other art forms um, to collaborate on collective initiatives and projects to have more people kind of pushing, pushing that information out and building that fan base organically and authentically as well. Is that something you've done in your career? I, I mean, do you, can you give us an example of what that might look like or? Not to That's put something you on the spot. I love to do. Yeah, no worries. That's something I love to do. And honestly, I haven't even <clears throat> tapped into it as much as I would like to because the bandwidth has been crazy. But um, I have a huge network of photographers, dancers, people who are in theater and just trying to, you know, maximize that that arena. Um, mm -hmm. I recently wrote this song about my brother and um, I'm speaking with a theater company around how to um, translate that song into a theater piece, incorporating dance. Um, and then my photography, cinematography friends will also buy in to right. um, capture that as well. So I think it's just one of those things of maximizing your network and not necessarily always um, kind of pulling into how can they help you but how can we all help each other yeah and how yeah. can we like play to our strengths and then therefore like make this amazing like this amazing project that everyone's super proud of and that can you know last for lifetimes yeah i guess that's truly you know thinking outside the box i mean as music people you know i'm speaking for myself i'm like music 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 but you're right you know if breaking down those walls especially for artists could be really powerful i think yeah, I think, um, uh, I think, sorry, John. Go ahead. I was going to say for, for a while, while I was at EDM.com, we had this one artist manager that we were working with who, you know, asked the same question. Like, how do I take this core audience that I have of really loyal fans and start getting other fans outside the scope of like this market that I've already kind of gotten hold of? And what he ended up doing was he went to the Ministry of um, the Ministry of Tourism for Australia and New Zealand, and for all of their like tourism videos that they make of like the different islands and the different locations that you can visit or whatever, he had them incorporate his artist's music into a lot of these like like international tourism campaign videos, and like would just find like really bizarre integrations for the music that could associate the artist with some other brand or some other thing outside their kind of endemic space, which allowed them to reach a totally untapped market, right? So I'm not saying that every artist should go and approach the tourism boards of different countries, but just like tapping into different opportunities like that. Like if there's some painter that does like live painting tutorials on YouTube or something, right? Talk to them about having your music included in that or if you're a big fan of esports and there's one streamer or one gamer that you particularly really like watching their streams and you've talked to them a bunch in their channel before and whatever, reach out to that person and see if you can make a song for them for their next, you know, their next big streaming event or something. Like there's always ways to find people in other spaces, other verticals of entertainment, other types of content or artistry or creative spaces and find opportunities to collaborate where they're bringing value to you, you're bringing value to them. And in, in the act of doing that, you're appealing to each other's audiences and expanding what both of you can accomplish together. So it's, it's like a very much like mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, let's, uh, there's some, some interesting questions coming up. One, um, 
you know, I think, I think you guys, uh, I think this is, is a good one um, from B. Um, what is the role of brands to help develop uh, an artist's online fan base? Uh, is it a dangerous choice in terms of identity or can it help to build a community? Um, you know, I know, you know, Ash, you, you work with brands a lot. Um, you know, ha how have you, what has your experience been with either, you know, Set the Sky or, or with Flight House brands and artists? Um, I'm not sure that I totally understand the question. The, brands in like terms of... Well, like, elf is it dangerous? Let's just, as an artist, right? Is it dangerous to align yourself with a brand? I think that's what B okay. is trying to ask. Um, is there... You know, you know it, are there pitfalls or or can it yeah. you know help supercharge? I'm going to answer it based on how I'm going to interpret the question. Um, okay. So I think you know there's there's brands or like platforms like um, an EDM.com or like an MTV or Complex or whatever they're like Lyrical Lemonade, you know, and that these are established brands that have kind of built a visual like audio like brand for themselves and I think there's nothing wrong with you know you an artist tapping into different communities and different brands to just reach a larger fan base I think I know that's something that like Mo Shalizi did with Marshmallow early on not necessarily with brands but he was releasing singles with every label um just to in different types of music he's done a day to remember Selena Gomez uh like urban like rap artists and stuff and with while still like staying true to what the marshmallow brand was but he was able to just tap into these other brands to just amplify what he was already doing and hit a fully like new audience but I think you do have to be careful of that if you can't you need to be able to step away from the brand and still have something and be an artist on your own and not be too reliant even with us you know with flight house what we're having to worry about right now is, yeah, we are slightly rel like reliant on TikTok as a platform. And sure, we are we have built ourselves off platform and are continuing to do so. But you never want to get like be totally dependent on a, a separate brand or a separate thing that you can't control. That makes sense. I interpreted it. I interpreted the question as meaning like corporate brand, like blue chip brands, mm -hmm. like a Pepsi or something like that. I, I don't know if that was. I'm not sure which way the, the question was intended, but since Ashley ended one and answered one, I'll, I'll answer the other one. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to like that type of brand, like a Red Bull or a Pepsi or a, you know, cash app or Apple or whatever, I think that it's a very, it's very much could go either way. You know, I think that there are brands like Red Bull and Nike who are known as doing an incredible job of culture marketing where like their their brand integrations generally are very much embedded within a specific type of culture that they've really cultivated long term as part of their brand identity right so you don't think about nike or under armor and not think about sports and the famous athletes that have been representatives of those brands right and that's because they've done an excellent job in the building of their brand equity and making sure that it is relevant and it is valuable and it is considered an organic part of that space, right? So I think that there's been a lot of like Red Bull sponsorships of like tours and events, same with like Monster Energy that have gone really well, you know, where the brand is getting the exposure that they want by, by reaching all the audience that is kind of their target demo. So like, you know, there was the Firepower tour back in the day that was, a, that was sponsored by Monster Energy, right? And the people going to those shows were the exact people that drink Monster Energy and Monster Energy was able to subsidize the cost of the tour and all the artists got some money from it, right? It's perfect partnership. Then there's examples uh, I don't, I don't wanna throw any specific brands or artists or anything under the bus, so I won't, I won't name anything, but then there's examples of brands that'll come in and they'll sponsor a tour and their version of sponsoring the tour is basically at every event, they just put a bunch of big plastered flyers up. And on the front of the stage where the artist is playing, they have a big sign that's their brand. And it's basically just like they're taking something that exists and painting their name all over it. That yeah, I would just not go very well. No matter what, like 
make sure that the artist is getting value out of it, it which should be money. Cause I think it's easy for you to see some like a Pepsi or a monster and be like, Oh my God, I'm going to get so much visibility from this, but exposure, like we, you like, we'd be providing so much value and culture and a community to this brand. That's just a corporate kind of thing, which sure there definitely is value that you can get from that visibility and from that kind of partnership, especially if it's like an organic fit, like for your existing brand. But I think it's just really important to not let them like pull a fast one on you and be like, look how cool this is going to look and make sure that you actually are getting, you know, your worth out yeah. of it. Yep. So that was, that was the next thing I was going to say is one, make sure that the brand is in some way relevant to your brand. So it's not just this like nonsense selling out collaboration. Um, and then number two is really make sure that you understand the value that you're bringing to this brand right? Don't, don't be taken advantage of because they're a big company and you're a small person. Like the reason that they want to sponsor your event is because they're getting a lot of value out of it. So make sure that you're getting value out of it as well. Um, Hannah had a, had a question that I want to hear the answer to when, when you're building your, um, you know, social media platforms like Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, um, what is the role of advertising or like promoted posts um, in that, you know, in building those communities? Um, do, Ramon, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I'm sure you grapple yeah. with that every day. Yeah, I mean, I think advertising is a big part. I think, you know, how you target, what audiences you target, how you build your audiences, you know, from the beginning. Um, I think is a really big part of how you're able to convert, especially when you start dealing with D to C, you know, physical uh, merch, things of that nature. Um, you know, at, at, at the on my day to day, you know, most of the um, you know positive paid ROI that we're seeing is on kind of like D to C as it relates to album sales, singles, etc., um, which are things that are obviously you know changing in real time. But you know, not only that, but on the YouTube side, um, you know, which I'm sure you know, Ethan, you know, is looking at a lot, you know, ads, ads specifically um, are a really great way to expand your audience, put your artists in front of um, people um, who are fans of affinity artists, if you're developing or similar artists, if you're a major artist, um, and really try to, um, you know, use it not just to drive views, but to drive an increase of um, conversion of a fan base. So um, ads are important, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a big piece of any kind of, you know, especially major label digital plan, um, it should be a part of any kind of digital rollout. Um, percentage based, uh, you know, to me is based on the content that you have around the rollout, whether you have an official video or you don't, whether you have, you know, a really great piece of content that's reacting well on Instagram that you think you might want to serve up to a wider net than just your followers so you can see if you can bring in new fans that way. Um, you know, I think ads are a big piece and, and making sure that you're using smart ad targeting and not just blowing through budget, whether your budget's a hundred dollars or, you know, 10,000, um, is I think, you know, a, a really important thing to, uh, keep in mind as well. Right. Um, you know, uh, uh the, the question of the day, like, uh, both, uh, Mark Cates and Michelle shocked both had questions on TikTok. Um, Mark, Mark put it, um, this way. My question of the day is what does everyone think about the future of TikTok with competition ramping up and regulatory questions um, and the threat of uh, you know, this administration pulling the plug on TikTok must strike fear into the hearts of uh, you know, some of the people on our panel. Does anybody have any thoughts of, about, about that? And um, you know, are, are we worried about losing TikTok? I've got thoughts for sure. <laughs> um, I think, you know, you were hearing so much stuff, you know, in this, over this panel alone, I've gotten two text messages with one link saying that, like, it's for sure that, you know, ByteDance is going to try to sell off a large chunk to an American company. So then there's no longer an issue. And I also got another article that's the White House saying that this, it will push TikTok off sooner than later within the next few weeks. So really everything is like hearsay. I think up if it was any other time than like this administration necessarily, I think that I wouldn't be worried about it at all because I think like as a whole, Americans typically aren't super about um, 
censorship and wouldn't be like necessarily a fan of that. But I think, you know, with, with everything going on right now, if it were ever to happen, it would be now. Um, I think, you know, for us, we've luckily been trying to move things off platform and not be totally reliant on the platform anyway, but, and we've been able to grow like an Instagram following to over a million and YouTube as well. Um, but, you know, we're now having direct conversations with Triller and Snapchat um, and Byte. And so we're bringing over about syndicating our existing content as well as like, Unofficially, I mean, we're also speaking with Instagram about their like reels uh, features that they're going to be implementing very soon. So, you know, that they're definitely have a big leg up, I think, because they kind of, they went live in India like the day after TikTok was banned in India. So they definitely are, they know what they're doing and are trying. And, you know, we saw what happened with Snapchat when Instagram went ahead and like took those features. So, I don't know. I think ByteDance has so much money and power and resources that it's going to be hard to like fully like eradicate that. Um, There is other options. And I think for us, the influencers who are big on TikTok, they're not going to just disappear. They're just going to move to another platform. So from our like B2B white label marketing side of it, we're not worried about losing any revenue because we still have those connections and they're still going to have huge followings just somewhere else. I wanted to ask Ramon about TikTok since, you know, it, it's not, I'm not saying Interscope is not really this kind of label, obviously, but, but, you know, we've seen a lot of incredible songs come out of TikTok. Like would the loss of TikTok, you know, be, you know, it, it's just been a breeding ground for some really incredible viral music. Like, do you think just from a creative standpoint, the loss of a platform like that would be harmful to to pop music um i have a lot of thoughts on it you know i think (laughs) from the high level obviously you know being a part of you know trevor daniels falling and a lot of the rod wave stuff playboy cardi a lot of these artists who have you know seen monumental increases in streaming just due to songs taking off on tiktok it's obviously an incredible platform with an incredible audience that seems to convert in an incredibly high volume to streaming services. Um, I think moving forward, um, what the music industry loses if it loses TikTok is um, that upside that it represents, right? I think to Ash's point, um, you know, that audience is still here. You know what I mean? It's just figuring out where they are. You know, for a long time, Snapchat was doing these global lenses, which are lenses that they serve to um, everyone on their app within the carousel, which was serving anywhere between 200 million and 500 million people per day. That was the first place that on the digital side, we started to see, oh, wow, we did something, streaming lifted 20, 30%. I think TikTok really democratized that whole process, right? The For You engine is basically Snapchat global lenses occurring in real time every second. Right. So I think when you lose that, you lose, you know, I think that that massive scale that exists. Right. But I think, um, you know, and also some respects, uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of shifted the conversation from from, you know, musical integrity to, to kind of what works on a platform, which, you know, is kind of what happens anytime something, you know, fundamentally shifting to the culture happens. But I think it's happened in such rapid succession right now because of how quickly TikTok moves. So I don't think, you know, you know, to your point, Interscope isn't a place that like necessarily that I've seen sign things based off of what's moving on TikTok. You know, there are a lot of labels that do, there are a lot of places that do. Um, but I think we've been fortunate to, you know, have the, you know, benefit of working some songs that have, have blown up on the platform, you know, that have been within our ecosystem and have, you know, been part of artist catalogs who, you know, we really see as career artists and not just single songs. So, you know, I think you lose that upside moving forward if TikTok goes away, right? There's not a platform where you could say, hey, XYZ artist with 10,000 followers on Instagram, you suddenly have a song doing 1.5 million streams a day on on Spotify because this song is massive on TikTok. You just kind of lose that. And that will pop up somewhere else, in my opinion. But um, the question remains to be, you know, answered if that somewhere else is as democratized as the for you engine is, you know, and I think yeah. that's yeah. yeah. The way I always look at it is the danger of being number one 
in a space is that there's always a hundred number twos ravenously waiting for you to fall. And so they can gobble up the number one spot. So the person that's number one always seems too rich and powerful to fall. But as soon as they fall, there'll be a bunch of Panthers that are just in there trying to be the next one. Yeah. And I think to like wrap that point up, you know, the music industry was existing just fine before TikTok. There was people were still having hits. I think if TikTok goes away, the music industry is still going to be there and there's still going to be hits and huge artists. So it'll just, in the bigger picture of the music industry, sure, it might affect the ease of like barrier of entry, but I think not much is going to change. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have, you guys. Uh, Kristen, Ramon, Ethan, Ash, thanks so much. Uh, Bobby, you want to wrap things up for us? Um, I, I, boy, I wish it could uh, keep on going, but uh, thank you all. I, I was sitting here and, uh, and very informative. I actually learned a lot um, and uh, really do appreciate everybody's time. Thank you for our audience. Um, of course, uh, wishing you all safety and health. I want to thank Ash, Kristen, Ethan, Ramon, and of course, uh, John Vlauten for being part of this today. Um, we hope to see you all again very, very soon. And See you later from New York. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. much. Bye. Bye.